Good. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people joining us. Uh, what is this evening in, in London? My name is Wood Roberto. I'm the head of the Visual Cultures Department at Goldsmiths. And I'm extremely delighted to be able to welcome you to the 2021 Mark Fisher Memorial Lecture, Notes from the Underground with Test Department and the cultural critics Alexei Monroe and uh, Pete Webb. Before we start, uh, I'll pass you over to my colleague, Yurella Andrews, who's worked tire tirelessly to put this event together for us this evening, um, as she has a few practical points to make about the technical side of things. Lovely, thanks Wood, very much. Yes, my name's Yurella, it's lovely to be here, it's lovely to welcome you. I do have a few practical things to say before we begin. I'm going to hand you over to Pete Webb shortly, he will be introducing and convening this event, which is going to include a 40 minute film screening and after a short break, a period of conversation and question and answer. Where the film screening is concerned, just in case this is needed, there is a YouTube link to this film. It's included at the top of the video description section of the live stream that you're using at the moment. So, you're very welcome to make use of that instead of watching it via the live stream if there are some quality issues. Um, so if you watch it that way, then you can then just join us again on the live stream for the conversation. So I hope that makes sense. Um, the conversation will probably begin around about seven o'clock or so. The other thing to say is that in the Eventbrite email that you will have received, you will have found a link there to a document that contains the film script, which you might want to take a look at. And there's also an extract of the almost 400 page long book, Total State Machine, that is there for you to enjoy. And this is courtesy of Test Department and Pete Webb, who runs PC Publishing. So that's a, a really lovely, lovely document. So you can access that by just clicking on the link in the email you got from Eventbrite. Just a quick remark about question and answer. If you'd like to ask questions, just put your questions in the YouTube live chat and I'll be keeping an eye on that and make sure that the guys get your questions. And that's it. I think you may have to log into YouTube Live in order to ask questions. But I think that's it in terms of all the preparatory stuff. And I'm just gonna hand over to Pete now and I just hope you, you really enjoy the session. Great, okay. thank you Pete. Thanks, Yurella, um, and welcome everybody to this um, event, the Mark Fisher Memorial uh, Lecture of 2021. Um, just to say a few things by way of introduction, um, the book Total State Machine was published in 2015, and it was the culmination of a very long, uh, complex process of collating, documenting, reflecting, and writing on what was nearly 35 years of Test Depth's work creating no something from nothing in true DIY fashion. Um, the book looks back, but it also looks forward. And of course, the future is now here. Um, and as Mark Fisher noted, capitalist realism and its deflating of consciousness through a lack of imagination of alternatives and a lack of being able to experience the early forms of alternatives to capitalism have left much of the population immersed in the people as product effects of big data and the growing time poverty of work or a lack of work as the economy cracks. Where is the inspiration for alternatives, even if they do come through capitalism, uh, than from beyond it, as Fisher suggested? Hopefully in this next hour and a half, we'll provide some thoughts, discussion, and eventually some further activity in that process. So we're about to see a film uh, created for this evening that charts some of the key events in Test Department's work in history, as well as their links to Mark Fisher's work, and their continuing engagement today. And I'm joined by uh, Gray, Paul, Brett, and Angus of Test Department, Alexi Munro, uh, and uh, myself, and we will all be participating in a discussion after the film, and you can ask questions through the uh, chat mechanism on YouTube Live if you sign in for it. 
So I'm going to hand over to Gray, who's going to start the film, uh, Test Department Notes from the Underground. Okay, so just going to disappear ourselves and start the film. You should see it very soon. Formation and early musical development of Test Department from 1981 onwards cannot be separated from the political, social and economic landscape of London at that time, which acted as both a resource and cultural amplifier for the group. It arose as an idealistic scream of anger, emerging from the firebrand energy of punk, its nerf endings exposed, emanating a raw sense of unfinished business. It was born out of the crumbling in the cities and economically decimated ghost towns of Britain, where the desolate boarded up high streets resembled the array of riot shields that first appeared in South London during the Brixton riots in 1981, known locally as the Uprising. Margaret Thatcher's election in 1979 had been the catalyst for the introduction of Reaganomics, opening the floodgates to an untrammeled free market. It heralded a rampant ideological drive which had little concern for any human consequences as a result of its implementation. Thatcher herself proudly stated there was no such thing as society, polarising the population into hardened positions that offered no opportunity for consensus or compromise. Such moments developing were to become the key cultural signifiers in the forming social psyches of the fledgling test department. An ex-industrial site is supposed to be mute. It should know its place in the symbolic order of sedative post-imperial heritage the test depths have always confronted. It should be picturesque, but not intrusive. It may retain a degree of eeriness, but this should not spill over or become active. One of the problems affecting much so-called hauntological culture is precisely its coziness even when applied to dark pasts. In short, too often, hauntology isn't haunting, or rather, is only safely and meekly haunting. However, a reoccupied, illuminated and amplified ruin, visible and audible at some distance, is more alarming. 
DS-30 was a rebuke to the cultural stasis and retrospection that Fisher diagnosed. The video featured hundreds of cold witnesses to the battles of the 1980s and how these haunt the present. Rather than burying them, it brought them back to life. The sequence in which archive photos of mining sites gradually fade into the post-industrial landscapes is a good example of this. Viewed alone, this could seem like an apolitical, hauntological fetishization, or even a celebration of the disappearance of heavy industry, regardless of human cost. Yet because of the conceptual aesthetic force and rigour of the whole, it avoids these traps. The film and the sight were certainly suffused with mourning, but also with anger. Tastep's militantly modernist melancholy leaves space for grief and the tragic, but also strives to avoid being captured by them. Rather than simply aestheticizing ruins, they agitate and galvanize them. Not ruin porn, but ruin prop, which transforms sites of inaction to sites of action. Here, like the historical Russian avant-garde, they suggested how art and action can be united without diluting the power of either. The proliferation of squats and thriving housing cooperatives in South London encouraged a disparate group of the socially disaffected and mostly unemployed to set up base in New Cross. Here they integrated with local students from Goldsmiths College, completing Test Step's first membership. This enabled free access to multimedia resources and created a burgeoning support network and fan base. It was also here, at the edge of the decaying docklands along the Thames, that Test Step first uncovered its creative inspiration. Their rough excavations tapped into a latent energy releasing an increasingly relentless sonic battery which years later became the driving force behind the expansive multidisciplinary collective titled the Ministry of Power. The regenerators of bust and boom undertook pitiless gentrification programs on the edges of the industrial hinterlands, driving out established populations while grasping new fortunes into the bargain. Simultaneously test-stepped as self-styled recyclers looked to sift and reconstruct the debris New sound possibilities were sculpted, creating a living instrument of change, a sonic war machine wired into the unrest of the times. In Deptford's Creekside, bordering the ancient base of maritime Greenwich, lay the residue of the glorious imperial past, rusting hunks of industrial machinery, shimmering in the heat of spring sunshine. Amidst the towering cranes and mechanical claws sweeping through the mountains of metal, the group swarmed and scavenged among the detritus, inspecting and testing the resonant sonic qualities of the waste products of a declining industrial era. Ruin and dereliction are also a form of official history. Allowing a site to rot is a slow motion form of historical erasure. A site like Beckton Gasworks was a decaying monument to the labour of those who had worked there, and also to those killed in wartime bombing. Yet closure can silence such personal and collective histories, as well as the actual sounds of labour and machinery. Forty years ago the group began to challenge this process in real time, 
learning how to occupy and to play ex-industrial spaces, how to utilise the acoustic properties of concrete, steel, iron and eventually increasingly vast buildings. As fast as Munisterism shut down sites, they scavenged and began to plan how to reanimate them. The debris lying around could be honed and forged into defiant new uses, as could the buildings themselves. Testap represent a mode of corrective cultural force, and one of the strongest expressions of this was the conscription of ruins and former industrial spaces as sites of corrective memory. This mode of memorialization is rigorous rather than resigned, and fights rather than celebrates the erasure of memory. Their interventions in such spaces challenge the narratives that declare when a space and its workers are useful and useless. The temporary artistic reoccupation and reanimation of increasingly vast spaces, whether still used in a ruined state or scheduled for destruction, can spur audiences to remember not just the specific histories of a building, but its wider physical and sonic environment, enriching the space and the memory of the space. Forty years on, who will control the coming wave of ruins to be that the crisis will create? And who will make them resonate and how?
put to death all the comrades in arms. Neath one banner, scorn all the lands. A bottle to death all the comrades in arms. When the collective is invoked, many are alarmed. They consider what they might lose individually, rather than going collectively. From the outside, the facade of Testap's militant collectivism can seem daunting. In many ways this was necessary. Much of its impact derived from having a fearsomely regimented image, which succeeded all too well in intimidating state authorities, as the surveillance they were subjected to revealed. 
The image of Test Step's total machine wasn't a romanticised form of the collective, but a forcefully functional and efficient one, especially as it clashed so vigorously with the privatising ethos of the time. In 1981, very few people imagined the levels of personalised commodification we see in the Instagram to Big Brother era, when we've all become products, and the unspoken command is to constantly reveal as much of yourself as possible. Their collectivism was a rebuke in advance to the Americanized selfie culture we're now consumed by. Perhaps we can draw inspiration from the refusal to share or to perform degrading emotional labor for corporations or social media audiences. Yes, their work is not emotionless or heartless, nor do they refuse all emotional labor. Instead, they focus productive emotions, anger, resolve, and militant melancholy. The collective was also always more flexible than it may seem, allowing for tactical alliances and productive meetings of minds, rather than demanding the total orthodoxy that their image once suggested. There are a few directly personal stories in their work, and Total State Machine was a rare example of the group speaking openly of their own biographies. While these definitely played into the group's work, they never became the subject of the work itself. By processing and depersonalizing emotions, they make them more collectively resonant. In 2021, they remain dissidents, subverting the emotional economy through collective resolve, setting out a model of focused effective labor that refuses conscription into shallowness. In the 80s, they wielded the spectre of the utopian collective, not just against the predatory Thatcherite state, but in the dysfunctional contexts of so-called actually existing socialism. It may be that their Eastern Bloc experiences of clandestine performances, militarised border crossings and police harassment are going to become very grimly relevant as we experience the accelerating failures of actually existing imperialist revivalism in England. We may face shortages of goods and compassion, but we will not face shortages of historical parallels and useful lessons from the past. One of the ironies of the European Network Tour 1985, which went through East and West Europe, was that regardless of the colour of the local political system, there was exactly the same higher level of police interest. We were trailed, documented and harassed in every country that we went into. It was like being in a strange state of siege. We were in a 1960s hand-painted sedan coach carrying a ton and a half of scrap metal in the back bunch of shaved heads and flat tops in the front, so perhaps we did look a bit unusual. That level of attraction began to break down some of the ideas that the West represented total freedom and the East is all repression. The state apparatus is used to survey and keep a very close eye on whoever was deemed the enemy within. We didn't even attempt to play in East Germany which was deeply repressive and in Czechoslovakia the concert organisers could have easily ended up spending a couple of years in prison. It was a very paranoid time and shows how brave the people were who tried to make things happen. They were taking a lot of personal risks. In Hungary, the authorities did try and intimidate people, but by that stage, no one took them too seriously. The police did detain and interrogate for low level information. Vince from Art Deco said that when we were traveling to Budapest, there's almost certainly a police informer among the group of people parting with us on that bus.
it's not only the materials or sounds of a location that can be useful and expressive. Its histories interact with and enhance the history of the group's site-specific engagements, even if these come to light long after the intervention. Here it's important to remember an older meaning of engagement that predates its use in so-called international art speak. What's relevant here is the martial sense. Engagement not just with a difficult or even hostile location, but with those forces who dictated its histories. Modern historical precedents for their work, such as constructivism, are well known. But there are other far older connections. In their early years, the decaying industry of Deptford was a key source of material and bleak inspiration. Yet besides its industrial history, the area has a strategic, political one. The old Deptford Bridge was the site of two highly significant struggles. In 1381, Wat Tyler led his rebels into London across it. It was also here that in 1497 Cornish rebels, led by a figure known as Anne Gough, battled an overwhelming royal force that had originally been intended to fight in Scotland. So the group gathered their sonic arsenal and began their campaign in a historic battlefield area strongly associated with the struggle against English royal power. Like so many others, these uprisings were crushed, but remain in the historical record, despite the indifference or hostility of councils. They form part of an alternate lineage of resistance movements, when the powers that be met defiant opposition. The finest hour at Expo 86 was a suicidal career move when it came to any hope of future arts funding. But it was an opportunity not to be missed, having the eyes of the world on us for Britain Day, especially knowing that Thatcher herself would be visiting the Expo site that day. We had a scary phone call from the Central Office of Information in London just before travelling, warning us not to torpedo the old country now. On the plane to Vancouver, I sketched a stage set inspired by the poster for Battleship Potemkin. As if by fate, the local scrapyards were full of old ships. With the organisers help, we hijacked the British military band from the Lancashire Regiment, who had no idea they were marching straight into the beginning of our show as part of a fake flag raising ceremony. This featured the Expo flag being taken down and our MOP logo being raised at the entrance to the arena. Our Britain Day show began thrashing out angry rhythms on rusty gun turrets with sledgehammers to images of Thatcher's Falklands Victory Parade with idiotic crowds waving Union Jacks intercut with Maggie's beaming face. It isn't, so please come. There was a barrage of tabloid headlines celebrating the sinking of the Belgrano. Argy bargy, up your junta. Classified film footage of British missile testing was used with film footage from Malcolm Pointer, another ex-Goldsmith student whose Horsemen of the Apocalypse sculptures were seen ushering in the end of the British Empire. Cut-up newsreel footage of mounted police charging the enemy within at Orgreave. A black British bugler, Jean Scotty Muir, who'd recently left the army due to institutional racism and striking minor Alan Sutcliffe, wrapped naked in a blanket reciting Bobby Sands' hunger strike poem, I Fought a Monster Today. In the light of this history, and their 1987 cooperation with another defiant Celtic force, Brief Goth, Tastept appear as inheritors and protagonists of this lasting legacy. Gododin was staged in the already doomed former Rover car factory outside Cardiff. The vast space was erased not long after the project temporarily resurrected it for a final battle. This symbolically connected two narratives the Thatcherite state was keen to downplay or erase, the Celtic and the Industrial. Their powerful mode of transgressive weaponised monumentalism tried to compete with and even to overshadow actual state and corporate rituals. From the mid-80s, they increasingly worked with orchestral and choral elements, augmenting their sonic power, and just as their work was orchestrated, they orchestrated the sites that they occupied.
the buildings needed to be played and sonically reanimated in a convincing way that left no room for doubt about the group's efficiency. The sounds were not only monumental, but could function as sonic monuments in themselves. They unnerved the state because they looked and sounded like they meant business. And being able to produce convincing work in this type of space was a key part of that. It was also unnerving and challenging because it could compete aesthetically and symbolically, partly by using the neo-imperialist symbolism of the Thatcherite state. Examples of this include the use of a military band at Expo 86, the use of Falklands war footage, as seen in their TV collaboration with Steve Martland, and the use of mass drummers and pipers, a technique that reached a climax in Glasgow in 1990. Their monumentalism could and can continue to have powerful effects, disrupting the symbolic order, compelling audiences to reconsider their stances, and perhaps inspiring future struggles. Perhaps it is possible to accept that monumentalism from below, while not a virtue in itself, can definitely have virtuous effects. Like Fisher, Testep tried to map and to combat what they called the sweet sedation of the market. Now, in an era of industrial scale, algorithmic self-sedation. The repressed demand for means to cast off sedation continues to seep through cultural and media filtering systems. There is a hunger for what the group now call industrial agitation. One issue we're currently confronted by is the overproduction of bloodless, nostalgist simulacra of 1980s styles such as industrial music. They stand out not just as historical pioneers, but also because even their newest work remains full-blooded, fueled by sweat and toil. This trace of the real makes it stand out, but, just as in the 80s, also guarantees that it will be partly overlooked. Of State Machine, which Fisher discussed, was self authorised and self built and released by an independent publisher. It didn't go through the usual channels, and even if it had been allowed through, could not have done so without some degree of tempering or decontamination to make it more palatable. Yet the price of refusing to make the usual compromises can be isolation. The Assembly of Disturbance, 2017, London. Test Step returned to the Capital, inviting an assemblage of collaborators to engage the popular imagination in spectacular involvement. Antipathy countered by the tactile, a catalyst of noise, infiltrating the airwaves with raw static, an act of disturbance to combat a state of mediocrity, a screaming voice in the face of apathy united in an alliance of rhythmic communication against the disintegration of the social into a perpetually tracked and monitored culture, looking to the revolutionary base of the senses, resounding profusely in the body. A greater musical collectivity, searching its deepest resonance, the senses re-engaged, 
in a resistance to the retreat into the straitjacket of the secure. Following their Expo 86 action, which no British publication ever reported on, and which I wasn't aware of until I began work on the book, the group noticed that British coverage of them dried up for some time. The situation now isn't radically different. What limited coverage their activities have received has been in a narrow range of alternative outlets such as Fact or The Quietus, and one isolated appearance on Radio 3. Beyond the existence of the book, which was scarcely reviewed, they remain peripheral and beyond the confines of music and subcultural history, and not really canonical. Besides the collaboration with AV Festival and Gateshead, their only other artistic presence in recent years was in a Leipzig exhibition space run by former East German underground activists. They remain largely beyond the pale of the wider art establishment, even those parts of it that claim to be supporters of radical causes. A statement of Fisher's gives some clues as to why this might be. In 2016, he lamented, there's almost a deliberate removal of effect in many pieces of contemporary art now. What makes it art is that you don't feel anything in relation to it. We're encouraged to feel that we're Neanderthals if we still think that art should create feelings and effects, but it should have aesthetic texture, content, etc. That's not sophisticated. Lots of tendencies in the contemporary art world are exactly against those things. But I'm happy to be a Neanderthal if that's the case. This artistic holding back operates in negative synergy with the exhaustion of the future that Fisher diagnosed, along with its associated depressive, inhibiting effects. Given the state of things, depressive nihilism and fatalism are tempting options for many. Knowledge of the apparent exhaustion of the future can itself be exhausting. In these conditions, the lure of a romantic decline and affecting nostalgia can be very seductive. Yet rather than fetishizing it, should we perhaps try to work through the exhaustion, as the group once did for hour after hour in a Dickensian New Cross basement? If you want a paradigmatic example of art and music that refused to collaborate in this removal of effect, even before effectlessness became an orthodoxy, test apps would surely be it. Sound man Jack Balkin remembers how seeing an action, quote, broke through a depressed core in me. This is an example of the galvanizing effects produced by working through the exhaustion. Perhaps hope needs to be worked for and at, to be produced and reproduced by constant rehearsal, repetition and exercise, mental as well as physical, or through metaphorical or literal drilling. Could this be one way to reforge or regalvanize new futures? even when the concept of utopia has been extensively privatised and trivialised. The shockwaves of post-imperial collapse, which both Fisher and Testat anticipated, are finally reaching the archaic Westminster structure, and the survival of the current state order is openly questioned. Besides a proliferation of ruins, we'll face a proliferation of debris of all sorts. Once again, Entire industries may be scrapped, and entire districts may experience the type of devastation that inner cities and industrial areas did in the 1980s. Even the most recently gentrified parts of the cities may be much more vulnerable than they imagined to the scale of destruction. 
Massive sedation and disinformation will be deployed to shore up the facade. But how well can these work, when rather than a slow, insidious cancellation of the future that Fisher described, individuals are faced with the brutal, overnight cancellation of their futures. There may be no alternative but to forage amidst the literal and metaphorical wreckage, gathering scrap, testing it out, and seeing how it can be made to resonate and to agitate. 21st century fuel to fight may yet be found amongst the falling masonry and toxic waste of actually existing British democracy. Okay, well, that was the film Test Department Notes from the Underground. Um, we're now going to have a short 10 minute break. Um, so we will start again at uh, one minute to seven. Um, and if you want to ask questions, there's uh, some questions coming in into the chat in YouTube Live, some very good questions already there. So if you'd like to uh, put a question forward, put one there, but we'll see you in 10 minutes uh, after a break um, and I think Gray is going to put some music up for you to listen to in that break.
Hi, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're now going to start a discussion. Um, for those of you who missed the beginning, my name's Pete Webb uh, from PC Press, and I'm here with Gray, Paul, Brett, and Angus from Test Department, and the cultural commentator and critic, Alexi Munro. Um, if you have got a question you want to ask at any point, then there is the chat function on YouTube Live, and if you can put your question in there, we will get to those towards the end of the discussion. Okay, I'd like to just start really with with the, I suppose, you know, part of the reason we're here tonight, which is Mark Fisher. Um, and Mark Fisher was one of the few people to review the book, Total State Machine. He, he did a review of the DS30 show that you put on in the early 2010s. Um, do you want to say something about the, the kind of impact of Mark Fisher's work and the impact of meeting him uh, on you and, and your work? Um, well, Mark, yeah, came to review the DS30 show. He was um, one of his favourite uh, test department tracks was a track called Statement, which um, we did with Alan Sutcliffe, the Kent miner you saw in the film. And um, he called that a really powerful piece of um, of sound, emotional engineering, I thought he said. Um, and when he came up to, to review DS30, it was, uh, the film was shown on the Dunstan Staves on the River Tyne. And uh, the audience were on boats, so they had to get on a boat and there were several trips over the evening, taking people under the bridges and up to the, to the Staves. And Mark Fisher was in the queue waiting for um, the, to get on the boat and he heard someone speaking behind him and then realised that it was Alan Sutcliffe who he'd been listening to for all his years since the mid 80s on that track. Um, so he started speaking to him. It was an amazing moment and, and we were together on a boat as well. Um, yeah, we, we spent a whole uh, evening uh, chatting together after that but I think um, that was the trigger really for for subsequent test department work and it's 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 maybe strange for people who weren't around in the 80s or weren't old enough in the 80s to maybe understand how important it was what what a kind of civil war was was going on and why it's resonant today and why we did that performance was um, A, to mark the 30th anniversary of the minor strike, but to bring it um, into the uh, consciousness to, to, to bring it back, to revive it as a, as a marker. Um, the minor strike was the beginning, the, the, the major point of, of the beginning of the whole neoliberal project in Britain um, that she knew she needed to beat the miners, and so she there could go on to lessen the strength of unions and impose a neoliberal agenda across uh, industry and, and which subsequently went across the world. So it was a really important thing, and, and at this moment when we're seeing the collapse of it, and the whole neoliberal um, arc is also. Um, tangent with capitalist realism, as Mark Fisher would talk about. Um, so it was, it was bringing that, that back and um, yeah, Mark Fisher's commentary and um, review of that, put that into, into light. Mm. Yeah, and just for our yeah. introduction with him. Yeah, okay. And I mean, a lot of th that work, DS30, and the, I mean, the, the actual production of the book itself was a, a kind of monumental uh, task. And I think, uh, you know, we worked through exhaustion, as Alexi kind of said about, you know, your working process anyway. I think we edited it about nine different times. We were constantly adding to it. It was a, a long process. Um, I mean, if, if you're thinking about how radical kind of uh, and political kind of artwork can be can be you know, approached today. Is this idea of kind of working through exhaustion kind of central to it? I mean, 
Paul, do you want to say something about that, how, how that kind of work process is, is important? Well, I think, um, yes, it was an exhausting uh, a project. Uh, fortunately, at that point in time, I, you know, I, I was made redundant from the job I was working in. So I actually uh, had a year to spend doing that. Um, and I think, you know, in these days, I think one of the problems that, that we all face is uh, this, this idea of uh, time poverty. Um, our, our, our work that we do outside of trying to be creative becomes more and more uh, intensive, the more and more demands. Um, this is all part of that, of, of what, was, what was brought in under the kind of the neoliberal agenda. Um, you know, anyone who works in education these days will understand that, you know, we, we spend more time doing activities which aren't, aren't involved in, in education whatsoever. They're just um, there to, to create data that gives uh, a simulation of, of, of education which doesn't really uh, take place. Um, so um, going back to, you know, the exhaustion of, of those areas, I mean, it, going back in the day, you know, we, we were, we'd spend hours and hours rehearsing, going through like really, really physical, physical, physical work. And I think that that is the, one of the keys really is to kind of try and break out of this the kind of locked in, locked in culture that we kind of feel that we're kind of embedded in now. And, and obviously with the, with the situation we're in, it's very difficult, um, but beyond that, you know, it's to try and break out of that and get into to being more agitational and more physical in, in, in our approach to, to what we're involved in. Mm. I think yeah. It, it, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was the whole thing about um, the, the early days we were unemployed, we would, um, well, Angus was a student, but we would, we would had very little resources, so we used what what we could around us. As it's in the film, you use your surroundings. We we tried to do that, but we were very much. Um, it was a DIY project. We 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 started off, and we we had a lot of anger. A lot of there was a lot of it was it was, it was a difficult time. It was we were coming out of um, the uh, big depression of the the eight of the late seventies, early eighties. And um, yeah, everything seemed to, as it does now, seem to be falling apart. Um, so we created our own world, our own reality in, in that. And, and as a collective, it was, it was uh, we, we found like-minded people and, and it enabled us to, to, to do that. And we also could then support each other in that. So it was it was a driving through um, the 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 work in that basement to get fit and to work on these rhythms and all sorts of uh, things and the ideas and we, we were just yeah we used it as an exorcism in a way. Mm -hmm. I think also, if you don't mind me chipping in, um, there was um, you know something else around that time was obviously where we were all living. There was a lot of squats and housing associations, and you know punk had just finished, and punk was kind of slightly falling apart, and there was a lot of heroin around and what have you. So I think you know it was also a survival technique of like you know are we going to succumb to that or you try and do something positive? And um, I think you know there was very much a feeling I think in the band that, that they needed to try and hold together some sort of discipline and structure and you know through that kind of work and physical activity I think the band were you know pushing themselves to a point where you do sort of go beyond it, it was going further than just being angry and smashing stuff it was kind of bringing out a tribal kind of really positive feeling and at the same time also with imagery you know we had this interest in Russian art and constructivism, but there was that Stakhanovite thing where, you know, the worker was glorified. And I think it was probably through Paul, because he was, you know, with his East European back, family background, he, he knew more about that um, kind of art and things. But I think we latched onto it because there was this incredible irony of idolizing the worker at the same time as the country 
was trashing the worker and the factories were getting pulled down, you know? So I think we just stumbled on something as well. It was quite resonant. Yeah, I mean, Mark Fisher described you as being popular modernists. Um, and uh, I think there's always a, a very strong positive element to your work. And it was you know, politically very inspirational for people who looked at it and inspiring activism. But I mean, Angus, did you kind of feel that at the time that in, in all that kind of, you know, dark, depressing kind of, you know, in post-industrial gloom of the 1980s, that you, why did you have such a kind of, you know, positive anger rather than a negative nihilist anger? I think there were two things going on. Part, part of our work was kind of like beginning to address how things were in the outside world and, and find a way to be relevant because we didn't just want to be sort of avant-garde pretenders um, because we'd all seen some images that we liked or were sort of playing with it, but to actually try and position ourselves in the real world. And it was very instinctive uh, without a lot of money in the band, all, all of the early journeys around Creekside and Deptford and down the Thames. Uh, it was just a huge playground for us to be able to, once we discovered that, that, um, that way of working and just recycling and working, the rag and bone man used to drop off petrol tanks for us because we'd work through them. It used to take about two or three weeks to uh, smash uh, a big <laughs> juggernaut's petrol tank into pieces because we were playing four or five hours a day. But I think it's it's that post-punk thing. We, we we started with an immense amount of attitude. And the anger, of course, was maybe towards the outside world, but it was also what we'd all been through personally. Uh, and although we've never talked particularly publicly about who we are as individuals, um, and very much it was about what we could do together, all of us had various demons that we were working through. And so that simple thing of working together and finding something that you could jointly believe in, finding a common vision that you could coalesce around was incredibly powerful. And we did go from, from really being fairly talentless, but with an immense amount of attitude to slowly month by month by month by month, grinding out, I mean, literally just grinding out mm. from a sort of a, a, a sound anarchy. Mm something formed that, that, that you could coalesce around, you could feel it in your heart. And we all felt the same thing together, incredibly mm. intoxicating. Mm. So on the one hand, uh, what we did was very liberating on a personal level, but at the same time we were aware right now we've got this force, we have this energy, how are we going to use it? How are we going to place it in the real world? Mm. And it, it's a gradual, it's a gradual, you're all kids. So it's a gradual process and it's hit and miss. But when, once, you, once you feel that and you hold on to it, I think it stays with you for uh, for the rest of your life. Yeah, and in, I mean, in, I've always wondered how many of you were actually, uh, you know, percussionists or drummers or able to drum, because you know that that was that a process that you just learned through doing it and through repetition and repetition and repetition, or was it something that you came to with a little bit of kind of uh, uh, already some technique or not? <laughs> Nobody knew how to play anything. I think I might have been the only one who knew how to play an instrument, and I was, you know, making the films. <laughs> it wasn't the it, it, it's it's just convey. It's like Fordism. You just kind of you just get there and you learn on, on on the job, and then it is repetitive action, and then you do actually become you know quite professional in it uh, as you need to be. Um, but um, yes. <laughs> But Toby, Toby was really like kind of like the Duracell bunny, and you could you could, you could give Toby a rhythm, uh, and he he could he you sort of switch him on, and he would play the same rhythm exactly, uh, without changing for a second, mm -hmm. for two or three hours. Mm -hmm. So that enabled us to improvise over the top, and once you clicked into that, and once you had two or three people forming around an intense rhythm, if there were people who weren't quite as uh, didn't have that same driving sense of rhythm inside them and were more random it sounded amazing mm -hmm. i mean i was used to, I used to say to paul paul play that again that sounded amazing and he'd go i don't know what i did <laughs> <laughs> but, but that made it because it was this freedom over this very 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 rigid disciplined bass there were bit moments of polyrhythm so at times it was like sort of white industrial culture. And at other times it was flying off into influences from Kodo or Africa and amazing polyrhythm, but we weren't studying it. We were finding it like any drama, the most basic thing, the sound you make with your two fists, your two hands, driving, driving, driving. It's, it's so 
it's that mixture. It's the mixture of, of discipline and, and a little bit of freedom within it as well. And then trying the hell to remember it after you've sort of driven yourself into a form of sonic stupor. Yes. I mean, and I suppose that's, you know, that is one of the inspirational elements of it, like punk, you know, where people didn't really know how to play instruments. It was about sort of turning your, your anger, your ideas into something that you didn't really know how to do and therefore came, came up with something interesting. But I want to sort of move on to something that you said a little bit earlier, um, Angus, which is about spaces. I mean, spaces have always been a key kind of part of, of what you've done, you know, talking about um, Deptford, Nettleton Road, Beckton Gasworks, um, you know, the Rover Car Factory with the Brick Goth thing. You know, why do you think space has been so important? Because it's, you know, something that featured a lot in the film. Yeah, I mean, Brett, Brett always said it from the beginning, that it, it is that, is that you, you found places that had been abandoned and, and they, were, they were sort of beyond. And, and uh, you know, they, they retrospectively, they got described as liminal or, you know, there's lots of terms for what these spaces were. But for us, it was, of course, they have an incredible physical effect on you and that transgressive quality of breaking in somewhere or finding somewhere that's that that's that that's not what it was and it's not become something else and I mean there was real there was real poverty down the Thames at that time you know as, as we saw in the film there was no gentrification so these places were often left for years and and I mean you know we really we really really spent a long time in those places and we found things we found stories the name the name Test department. It was test department number six when it started. Was was written on a bucket that Graham found in a sort of abandoned office around the corner. We never. We don't know what the test department was. We never did. We never found out. Still trying to find out. <laughs> it's, um, it's 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 that sense of of a place that you can go and you could make your own. And so that that sense that because we had little money. Mm. Um, we were sassy, we had a lot of attitude, but we had little money that we, you could take these places and you could make them your own. And it was this massive, it felt massively important. And, and, and this, this, you know, we know that there were a few bands in the late 70s, um, early 80s, who were, who were taking the, the, the same attitude, is find somewhere and make it your own. Make your own statement, make your own world. And you could do that because you could do it really cheaply. You could do it under the radar. And this amazing sort of like informal networks and people would come and they would call us. All of our early work was in these, uh, a network of railway arches. Uh, and we did quite a few kind of legal or semi-illegal uh, concerts where people would just coalesce at a certain time where it would go out and we'd be playing in these dusty, uh, dusty old places. But they were ours. We could make them. We could really make our own world within it. Yeah. I think that, that was, that's what... We, we, we created, um, and from the beginning, it, it was an organic process. We created this kind of DIY collective because we started doing it. We were outside the system. We felt outside the system. We felt excluded. And we started this work, and, and it just grew and grew and grew gradually. Um, when we had to do, when we finally came to do a concert, we organised our first concert in a, in a hall in Lewisham. Um, and when it went on from there into these industrial spaces where we would put on concerts, we didn't play in any venues um, in the first few years. And it's, that's gone through throughout, um, that went throughout our whole um, career really through the nineties. But, um, uh, well, we sometimes obviously played in, but um, in, in the beginning we didn't, we created our own spaces we, we, and that is where that, as Alexi talked about, our monumentalism grew out of actually starting from the smallest little railway arch into these bigger and bigger spaces. I mean, we were lucky. So it was, it is about the time and about using your surroundings. And obviously um, those, those in, industrial, post-industrial spaces don't exist anymore. Mm. Um, I know. But, yeah, there's, there's quite likely to be a lot of uh, other other empty spaces soon with um, people moving out of offices and home working. And so we, yeah. We'll see. Yeah, it's a whole I, different thing. I, I see that Grilled Cheeseman has uh, asked that question really on the chat about um, has the continued use of these industrial post-industrial spaces for massive suburban building project affect the ideas 
disgust of reclamation. How mm. can we claim these post-industrial spaces when they've been paved over? Mm. Um, I think yeah, a lot of the post-industrial spaces have been reclaimed, but you know, as we were saying, I think there's a lot. What is going on now? Um, you know, there is so much construction going on. We're wondering what the construction's about, and we're looking at. at you know where that how how we're going to sit in in a year's time. They're building office spaces, and offices are now deciding. You know they don't want to, they don't want office space. People mm. can work from home. They can they can be more, uh, e you know, economically um, productive by by letting people spend less time in office. I mean minimal office space, and that's one example. So we're going to have all these spaces that are going to be. You know, they're going to be up for grabs. I think um, obviously with the collapse of. The high street, there's going to be a lot of spaces there. So I think it, it, it's not the post-industrial spaces we're looking at now, but the post-COVID spaces where mm. there's going to be possibilities. Mm. You know how 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 we work that. I don't know at this point in time, but it, but it's that's certainly the, 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 where we where we have to start looking at this point. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's also interesting that back then, um, as Angus said, these these buildings were left for years, literally years. Mm. Um, when we squatted the old synagogue, it had been an em empty for 20 years or something, hadn't it? So uh, this, this uh, property didn't have the value it has now. And obviously um, now property up until COVID was the thing. Property mm. was everything and you were, you, you'd be out straight away. But yeah, um, post COVID, we're looking at a new world and it will be interesting to see how that progresses. Yeah, right. Do you want to say something? Like that? Um, I'd quite like to add something to that is I don't think it's just about the nature of the physical spaces because obviously we lived in a particular time when, you know, there was all this sort of um, empty Victorian warehousing and things like that. You know, it wasn't just what we were doing. There were artists who had loft studios and, you know, it was a whole different time. Um, but I think what came out of that is when we did some um, quite odd choices of performance, like the Cannon Street gig that we did um, in, in the City of London, you know, that was interesting because I, th I don't know quite how we managed to blag that, which probably Angus is doing, but <laughs> the fact that we went and performed in a very unconventional space, and that wasn't squatted or derelict, it was just, you know, we put on a show in something that was normally a railway station and, and somehow got permission to do it. But I remember going in there and rather than just using the normal visual stuff that we projected, you know, I took a camera and went all around the city and the financial district and created images that were related to where we were playing. And we had, you know, loops of footage going that were site specific. And, and I think, you know, we started doing that a lot in other shows. You know, we'd go and play in some place in Spain that was an abattoir. And I remember getting hold of old film footage, you know, from a surrealist filmmaker who'd done this black and white you know, a documentary in, in a slaughterhouse in the 30s or something, you know, and I think a lot of the work became like that. I think these accidents happened and then we realised that something was possible that just took things to another level and then we'd go and seek it out, you know, and just do different types of shows, incorporate other elements. So I think it was just the beginning of something, but that relates to anything you do anywhere, you know, it's an attitude. Yeah. yeah, and in order to do these shows and in order to do these kind of monumental events, you know, one thing that's key for, you, for your work was a sense of a collective. And I suppose in these times where we're, we're isolated, we have COVID, but also before that, uh, you know, the whole idea of big data and people be, becoming highly individualized is more and more apparent. Um, how do you think that, that we can maybe reconfigure a sense of the collective and, and uh, in terms of you know, current artistic work, but also in terms of current activism. I think just to, for me, the um, it's an interesting time because uh, things are disintegrating in a different way for different reasons, but it still means, I mean, we, we were always operating in the cracks and a lot of interesting work operates in the cracks. And I think there was a lot of uh, interesting space to take back and you just have to find it. And it's, it, it's out there in spades and the interesting thing just now is that a lot of certainly as I'm witnessing around Scotland just now is that a lot of local authorities are really 
they're kind of not behaving like they used to behave. It's like some of the some of the institutional aspects of things have broken down because it's just individuals now and Zoom meetings like this, and it's the, the certain hierarchies just don't work anymore. And the question is, will they be when that's gone? Can you just sort of rewind it back? You can't because it's a different world. And the activism, the environmental activism that's coming through from the next generation, which is so strong and so clear, our generation who fucked it up, frankly, you know, it's like we have to support that generation. That's the way I see it. People ask me what work I'm doing now and, and what, what are the applications now to get beyond that um, reality that Alexi's talking about of us being commodified and simply just being another bit of data to be sort of you know chewed up and and and, and sold or sold on in, in essence uh, as a sort of useless individual it's about how you take things back into the physical world and I think it, it is about reoccupation of space on a hyper local level every one of us wherever we are for, for me it was the the inspiration for me in the last few years is a lot has been around food growing i think it's a very simple way that we can take control uh very simply learn some skills and take take control of aspects of our lives by growing food and sharing it with other people it's so simple and it builds community and it's a brilliant way to bring cross-generational people together because old, older people have skills some grandparents who learn stuff and dig for victory and then you can work with two-year-olds who are fascinated with finding a potato in a bag. It's, it's a way to build community. And that is inspired by what happened in Havana, where when they lost their finance from Russia, um, you know, they used to get a, a, a lot of subsidy. Within two years, they had to grow their own food wherever they could or they're going to starve. And they went through amazing production where they just used every crack between a building, every bit of available space, and it became an inspirational model for how people can support themselves. And of course, that's just food, but it can also amplify into other ways of being. But I think it's about taking small spaces, working with the skills of people in your area, supporting them. The big picture is out of our control just now, but we can do things on a hyper-local level and build real contact and real communication and friendship and love to each other. And that helps us get through. Graham Paul, I mean, what do you think about this this issue? Because you've been, you know, continuing to do the test department's kind of, you know, collective work approach in terms of music and art. I mean, how do you feel that that can op can be operationalized in the current period? Um, well, the, the, for, from the development, the, I mean, the collective of test department, which expanded. Um, According to to the work we did, we did a lot of uh, um, we 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 worked with the community with the community in a lot of different situations, and then obviously when we were uh, talking we were working with um, campaigns or struggles, then we always tried to work with people from those campaigns and struggles, and um, we. I suppose it's about learning, growing. It's about uh, keeping, keep on, keep on, keeping on moving your horizons outwards, trying to to understand what's going on. And I think with the collect, with the, with the collaboration, and in that collaboration, the collective of that, you you get to those points. You always expand what you know. And you expand your horizons. You 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 open doors to to what you can can learn from others. And I think um, in in collective work, that's that and collaboration. That's that's in, that's an important kind of mm. thing, figure. Yeah. Paul, do you have any f reflections on that? I mean, I know you, you put together the event, uh, the Assembly of Disturbance in 2017, and you know many people came together to put that event on, but how was that kind of process for you? Well, yes, it was, it was trying to create a new collective of, you know, within, within an environment of, uh, you know, a, a very individualized uh, cr creative kind of practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, within London, uh, you know, I think, it, and it worked to some degree, uh, and and it failed to, uh, on, on on you know different aspects of it. But it was it was as a, as a process uh, and a practice. I think it, it it was it was really good. It it was 
they gave us a chance to kind of uh, get get our archive stuff up there, get all the stuff that we've done, and start to move on from that and, and involve new collaborations and and involve, you know working with, with, with different people in a different sense. And so that you know that that was you know a, a quite a, a big shift at that point in time. Um, but we you know we're always looking to to you know be collaborative and, and work collectively with people if people have got good projects or ideas you know please contact us and you know <laughs> we, we like to work that way you know i think it's it's just important as well at the moment because obviously everyone is is isolated and um and also with social media and with with uh, with the kind of isolation of the 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 kind of miniaturizing of, of work in a way where we used to 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 make records in big in studios uh, and now everyone does it on their laptop or um, work is is put down to to a laptop and a, and, a, and and now basically a laptop and a, and a camera and communication is that so I think in in this time it's about work how do we how do you make those connections? How do you expand them? And how do you work, work mm. on, on them? Mm. And how ad adaptable can you be? I, I suppose I was, I've just been working in Vienna on a, on a, on a dance project with uh, dancers and choreographers and filmmakers, and we managed that. We were originally going to do a live performance. While I was there, it was cancelled, and then we had to change everything, and it became a um, an online show, but we still tried to to do that differently to big build it up into a um, into a, a something something different. It wasn't a test department show, but it, it involved the current test department uh, visual person David Altbeger and te mm. test department's uh, sound person Lottie mm. Roulet. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I want to turn now to, I suppose, the more kind of thorny subject of, of uh, the state and the state uh, intervening and uh, trying to affect kind of radical uh, artwork. And, and it's interesting that you've ended up on the label One Little Independent with uh, Crass, who also had their brushes with the British state in the 1980s. And uh, I just wonder what your reflections are on, on how artists should kind of feel about how they should approach, how they should think about the, you know, the impact of the state on their work, especially in these times of high surveillance, you know, in terms of whatever we do, it's kind of recorded and, and filmed some or swiped to some extent. Um, you know, how do you, how do you feel people should approach this? Because I suppose any radical work is always about losing something as well as trying to gain something. And in some senses, you lose a bit of a sense of your, your own personal freedom or the possibility of it by doing something radical? Um, <laughs> I have to think about this. For, for, yeah, um, I mean, Alexi, have you got any sort of, you know, reflections on this in terms of, you know, the impact of the state on, on art? Yeah, well, the state is, um, if we think about Eastern Europe and the kind of places they played in the 80s, it was clear there were there were informers on the bus. Mm. The, the police were all around, visibly and invisibly. Now we're all our own Stasi. We're all we're monitoring ourselves. We're betraying ourselves constantly. But at the same time, the volume of information that we're putting out there is so massive that even, you know, they're having to build larger and larger servers to try and sift through all this stuff. And in the, the volume of information, stuff filters through, stuff creeps through. It's, it's not as uh, all powerful as it might seem. Uh, but one, I mean, two things I should really stress, I would say that going back to the East European comparison, we've always believed that the informers were always in the East and that there's no question that there are informers here in universities or cultural circles or whatever. 
Now, it would be almost impossible to document it, but I guarantee that there are. Mm. I guarantee it's simply not conceivable that that doesn't happen, even with the self-surveillance. Mm. So we should always remember that. And while remembering that, I think I've been in quite a few of these events recently where we discuss, you know, how how is it possible to break through now? How is it possible to disrupt the system? And one of the big aspects of that is not announcing. Because a lot lot of contemporary activism, artivism, et cetera, said, we are going to do precisely this on precisely this date, precisely these people, precisely these methods. No, that doesn't, you know, if, if you're doing that, you'll get the result, you'll, you'll get the glory, but it won't have an impact. Mm. So people need to recover a tactical sense and mm. act without warning and perhaps act anonymously, not ever taking the credit. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because it, it's at that level where there's maybe more potential for disruption. Mm. And, and really finally, quickly, the GameStop story that's come up this week, this group of people on Reddit out doing the hedge funds and disrupting the market. That's mm-hmm. really interesting. And I, I think uh, like whether it's the state or the market and there isn't much difference between them now, mm-hmm. maybe the motto that's needed is disrupt the, the disruptors. Mm-hmm. Get behind them, outdo them. That's where potential is, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I think t- t- uh, tactics with obviously with new technologies, definitely um, new technology. T- tactics with uh, um, the technology at the, at the moment needs, yeah, needs to be developed. Um, it's 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 tricky. The self surveillance thing we, we, when we were doing things back in. The 80s and 90s and tracked by the state or various states um obviously they didn't have that level of surveillance they were, they were filming uh, from rooftops and demonstrations um they had people marked down but um and they knew what we were doing for sure and as as demonstrated in the phone call mm-hmm. um, we got before expo and um, phone tappings, which we had during, which we um, had during the miners' strike, where we heard uh, messages being played back to us from a phone call. Um, so, so that that was going on. But now, everyone's it's 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 all out there. Um, we have our phones, and we have our obviously there's there's ways of of covering up some of uh, your communications or encrypting it or whatever but uh, yeah that I think it's it's interesting that the the change and how um, we look at that with with art I don't know you know it, it's it's interesting with the capitalist realism mm. idea with it we're, we're a commodity so the idea is Mark Fisher talked about is you everything is consumable so mm. even the dissidents that we um portray and put forward is is becomes in the cap- capitalist market something to sell um so how do you get a- around that it's, it's it's very tricky i mean um as you say we have a we have a record we have a record uh, deal with one little independent and you know, it's in there. We're selling records. We're in the market. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have the answer for this, but it's 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 something that we didn't really we, we could um, probably get further along the line outside the system than you can these days. Or you have to use look for for. Um, um well other means anyway yeah and i suppose it takes a lot of a certain type of motivation to continue to be peripheral because your your work is is radical um 
and continuing that over 35, 40 years is quite a uh, feat. So uh, I think uh, we should say hats off to all of you for, for doing that. Um, for surviving. Yeah, for surviving. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's yeah. all about now. <laughs> Fucking survive. <laughs> listen, um, uh, Pete, take us into some of the questions because there's been a lot of stuff in yeah. the, I've tried to answer a few directly, but I feel we're not, we're not, we're, we're rambling shamelessly in the way that we often yeah and that you should take us into some direct hard questioning by this very patient audience. Alexi, do you want to come yeah, up? Yeah, so um, the question. first question is pretty hard. Uh, <laughs> when assessing politically mobilized art, there is a danger of only measuring concrete achievements, but using that tool of measurement picks up on failure. How does one speak outside that to spell out TD's victories? In other words, you were involved in a lot of campaigns that failed at the time, but what's the legacy of those? You know, how, how do you measure the group's success after all this time? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, there's probably a, uh, an argument for saying, don't get test farmers to bought you. <laughs> It'll just <laughs> collapse. Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, it's, it's true, but, but the, the legacy, for instance, of, a lot of the struggles we've been involved with was that um, activation of um, politicization of, of people, of, of uh, people who weren't political before, and also the collaborative um, aspect, the, the coming together of communities. These are things that last throughout and they carry on. Um, we're still in touch with Alan. We, we, we're still in, in touch with community down in um, Aylesham and Snowdown Colliery. And um, we're, we're, we continue um, connections we've made over that time. And that went throughout. It's, it's sort of the, um, has been in lesbian and gay support of minors with the film about their experience during the strike pride and um, those connections are still there. These things under the surface are all still there and have all, also been informing the work ever since then. So I think it's not measured in, in the, the outcome of the strike is, the outcome of the strike is measured in the mess we're in now. This is, this is the direct outcome of, of, of that, the, the loss in that strike. Um, yeah, and just, just to yeah. Say, add to that, Graham, I mean, it, it, always go back to the Dalai Lama, never give up. It's the same, just never give up. I mean, whether, whether you win or lose, it's, it's just don't give up. Be true to yourself, be true to your beliefs, support other people. And um, that's what I love about Paul and Gray because they're the heart of test department now. I mean, you know, Brett and I and other people uh, come in now and again and, and do things, but the, the heart's with Paul and Gray. I, I, what, I, what do I love about Paul and Gray? They're still fucking angry. <laughs> That's what it takes. 40 years of solid anger. <laughs> and using it and using that creatively. Not, 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 not being lost in it, not, not being bitter, but just using it to staying true. It's so it's, that's, that's the, you know, love or hate Jeremy Corbyn, he stayed true. You know, he, 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 kept, his, he kept his thing here. Okay, different story. But, it, but that, that, that's the thing, stay true. Uh, but, but still anger, anger is a fuel, as a fuel, but we, we're, we're not all, always angry. We're full of love too. <laughs> Alexa, we've got another question from yeah, you. So Twin questions, really, uh, from Espectra Negra in Berlin. Um, where can we find resistance and agitation in England today? Uh, and then briefly, yes. Move to Scotland. Yeah. Move to Scotland. Hi. <laughs> uh, um, what is your take on today's new empire? So how, how do people, what are the contemporary faces of empire? And how can people resist it? How do people resist it in England? 
I mean, I'd, I just yeah, maybe just say something quickly there about, I mean, I think that, you know, there is a lot of um, positive kind of developments in terms of the mutual aid movement that have been kind of operating through COVID times, often from, you know, kind of radical uh, kind of social centres um, in some of the major cities of, of Britain. The Black Lives Matter movement in, in Britain, as well as across the world, has been great in, in sort of really pushing forward and developing new young activists. Um, the anti-fascist movement is still very strong and, and has, of course, a big role to play. So, you know, and, and I think there's the beginnings of a kind of, a, you know, attempt to, to repurpose empty spaces in, in the city centres where, you know, people are beginning to think about how they can reuse these spaces in different ways, the, the emptying out of the retail centre. But, you know, so those things I think are, are positive. I mean, I think it's important to say that, you know, I think from a European perspective, you know, Britain, it just seems like such a ridiculous place. Uh, and but, you know, a lot of us feel that feel the same way, you know, but in terms in terms of what happened with the Brexit, I hate to mention that word, but, um, you know, it, it was pretty split down the middle when it was only the media that kind of carried it the other way. But I think I think it, within time there'll be a bit more perspective kind of shown, and and there and the kind of resistance to it will will, will kind of rise again. And I think you know we will start to kind of seem a bit more like a normal country once we get rid of these people that are in control at this point in time. I mean, no one takes them seriously. Um, you know, even their own supporters don't take them seriously. <laughs> um, that you know. Labour Party is is kind of all done and dusted, really. But you know, something new will hopefully will come out of this terrible kind of situation we're all in. And you know, when that moment arises, then people, you know, people will have the opportunity to kind of take it uh, and move on. I mean, Scotland is already kind of doing that via using the social nationalist uh, SNP as a as a as a as a kind of proxy, really. I don't think everyone up there. Uh, they're all they're not nationalists in the same way that you might see it within Europe, um, but you know it's a vehicle to, to to force change and get rid of the empire. You know the, the UK is breaking up. Even Northern Ireland now, you know, they realise that Brexit is a disaster, and you know there's going to be a unified Ireland. I'm pretty sure within, you know, certainly within you know the, the next decade, if not much much sooner. Um, so, yeah, so once the UK breaks up, then the empire, you know, it doesn't really exist. We now we'll be floating in this kind of free free trade uh, vagueness that, um, you know, and see where we get to with, with that. And I think, you know, at the end of it, we'll kind of realise, well, actually, I, we're, we're much better in a European partnership. Um, and we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. All right. So, uh one more, um, we've got so many questions and I can't really do them justice. Um, so I'm going to uh, switch to the end of a very long question. Uh, does the expectation of conformity and compliance leave a gap waiting to be exploited by a new wave of cultural resistance? Question for anybody. It sounds like whoever wrote that should do it. <laughs> it's great. Go for it. <laughs> the expectation of conformity and compliance. Yeah. Open. Can you repeat? <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the, it's, uh, people becoming passive, people becoming cynical, etc. Et and the system even relying on that in a way. Uh you know, does, does people's disengagement actually leave a gap in which a new wave of cultural resistance can come through? Well, I think it has to, it has to, doesn't it? It has to. I mean, the, 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 the thing is we, we have to, at some point, change um, the society we're, we're living in, the whole model of it, the capitalist realist model of it. It has to, we have to, to come to a new a solution, a new agenda, a new way of being. Um, this climate crisis isn't going away. At some point that's going to say, okay, you've all got to live a different way. You have to now, right now. And actually we're at that point. But um, 
people aren't animated, so the conformity is going along with the system we have. We we have to change it. Um, and when that realization bubbles up to enough people or 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 comes through. I mean, I think it's already being talked about in, in artistic ways. Um, and of course, in communal ways, like as, as you mentioned, the, the DIY um, communities and, and social centers and, and things that are, are happening. Um, but a lot of people, of course, realize that, uh, that we're not just going along with it, we're not, not just conf we're not conforming, um, and have some. There has to be something new. Can I say? Um, I think I think um, it's it's a kind of very Mark Fisher type question. If you don't mind, I just I was made a couple of notes earlier, and I think this is kind of relevant to that question. Um, Mark stated, um, "Capitalism sucks up culture, sucks up history." turns the very things that made us human into museum pieces. Mm -hmm. Everything is objectified and it's commodified. We have replaced human engagement in life, in life, culture and politics. We retroactively learn what it is to be human. We retroactively examine truth rather than engage in activities that make it so. And I think that's kind of really, really kind of vital. It's just like, yes, we have to start re-engaging after the after the covid is over it's like put down your fucking phones stop, stop staring at screens and get active start doing stuff start engaging with people start creating make your own collectives build things you know on a personal level get interested in in different stuff um you know we have to break out of the bubble that we've been we've been put into you know it, it's become a straight jacket of conformity and that it, you know it's time to time to make a personal change and you know it's difficult because we all love it as well but that is part of you know being involved in capitalism you know you have to kind of think okay what we we take some we take some of the the pleasures from that but you know we have to look beyond that i think we've probably got time for maybe one more question alexi we've got one more that too um i think I mean, Angus has been doing a great job of answering real time in the chat. Mm. Um, so mm. I would say we've covered pretty well. I mean, I think just maybe each of us will, will, will wrap up to some extent, but you know, we shouted as loudly as we could when we were kids and here we are and we're all in our, you know, 50s and 60s. And um, the bottom line is that we've failed the next generation. I mean, everyone of our age has failed the next generation. What's happened with COVID, what's happening in the environmental um, relationships across the world, you know, all of the big countries not coming in fast enough. We're failing everyone who's now 10 to 30 years old. And we need to get the fuck out of the way and support them to come through. Because if I was that age, I simply would not put up with it. And we're vulnerable. This generation is now vulnerable. Everybody knows that they're culpable. Yeah. Now is the time to push and push back. And I, I do think that there are, there are certain moments in human history where things happen. And if enough, enough young people push and push back and say enough, mm. we're gonna do it differently. I'm gonna right. do it in a more equitable way. Yeah. And you have to believe that things can change. It's not gonna be us, we'll support them. Right. Hey, hey, there was, there was, sorry, just one thing. There was, there was a, a question why there is no females on the panel. I think, Graham, can you invite Ludi in uh, to say hello? Because Ludi was involved in a, in a big way in, in getting this thing happening and, and created the film. So <laughs> I'll see if she can. She'll come in. And there, there was also uh, a question about how TD worked with Liz Rankin, which I should have mentioned. Oh, yes. it would have been great. It would be lovely to invite other people in, but obviously, with it, it's, it's quite difficult, and not everyone is is really into the Zoom culture or wants to be involved in, in 
uh, social media culture as well. I find that, you know, that's a lot of people we, we work with in the past, they're not interested in, in this culture. They like on a physical level. Yeah. We, yeah. Um, we were always a, a right bunch of lads, there's no doubt. <laughs> very male, very male um, rela- uh, reality to test department. And then we work with a hell of a lot of amazing women over the years and everyone has continued to do so. Liz Rankin, I first saw Liz Rankin when she was um, goose-stepping around um, the uh, refectory in Goldsmiths College in about 1979, 1980, uh, with uh, a rubber glove on one foot and and an open Doc Martin ripped to bits on the other, wearing these amazing bits of string, like she would wear clothes with bricks where the bricks had been cut out, all stitched by her mum, who's this amazing uh, woman from the north of England who could just make these amazing bits of clothes that Liz, six foot three, wild red hair, a complete Amazonian force of nature. Mm. And she was, that was her doing a performance. And then they tried to kick her out of Laban. And I went in and screamed at the uh, staff at Laban that you wouldn't know talent if it hit you in the fucking face. Liz is the best thing that this college has produced in the last 10 years. Mm. And it was, and she was brilliant. She went on to dance with DV8 with Lloyd Newsom and has gone on since to work with Shared Experience and do lots of shows with the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company. She's an amazing choreographer and has remained very true to herself. Force of nature, a true soul. And that's the type of people we were lucky enough to work with. And okay. Yeah, got- no, thanks, Angus. And, but any, any last... Sort Just of like to say, Ludi, who made the film, is who did edited the film from the archive, is here to say hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're drawing to a close because we, the, the event finishes at eight. And I just wanted to mention that there is um, another uh, Mark Fisher uh, kind of inspired event um, taking place at the ICA online um, from, I think, midnight tonight for a couple of days uh, called K-Punk uh, Post-Capitalist Desires. And it's kind of celebrating the publication of, uh, I suppose, Mark's last book, really, which is the final lectures of Mark Fisher, and it's called Post-Capitalist Desires. So for those of you interested in that, that is happening uh, through the ICA. Um, and I suppose it, it uh, you know, comes to us to, to draw this to a conclusion and say, you know, thank you so much for taking part in this. You know, we were really kind of overwhelmed with how many people uh, signed up for this event. And it's great to see you know, people interested in this uh, in this project and also in the continuing kind of ideas of, of groups like the Department and Mark Fisher. So thanks very much, everybody, for, for participating. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Nice one.